Hello, welcome to The Horticulturalist. I am Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan, and we post a video every Friday. So why not hit subscribe and the alert button to remind you. And also we're now doing shorts. So if you've got a question you'd like to ask, Put it in the comments below and, and the <laughs> good horticultural specialist, Stephen Ryan, will try and answer it. And if you can't, we'll just forget it ever yeah, happened. Yeah, exactly. Right. Stephen, mm. you're standing proudly, leaning on a sign. Yes. Tell us everything. All right. Well, I hold several national I was collections. Say, but there the, might be a cheeky few, one or two others. Yeah, but this one that we're going to talk about today is my National Cornus collection. Mm -hmm. And so I hold that collection for Plant Trust. So at my nursery, I hold the collection of Cornus. At the moment, I've got something like 44 different species and cultivars. Mm. So that includes man-made hybrids, etc., etc., yeah. of a genus that w in the wild consists of about 51 accepted species. Aha. Uh -huh. So the common name for Cornus is... Dogwood. Which is what most people know them as, yeah. and I do as well, yeah. dogwoods. Now, yes. we should explain the common name, or at least attempt to. Okay. Because uh, there's Good about point. three versions of the common name's origin. Yeah. One is that the bark of one of the European dogwoods was used to make a wash to wash mangy dogs. So that's very romantic. <laughs> okay. The other one is that dogwoods were in fact used, the wood of dogwoods was used to make skewers, because it makes quite a hard wood. And in Old English, skewers were also known as dogs, so hence dogwood. Okay. Um, so there's lots of different sort of stories about yeah. where the name dogwood came from. I don't think any of them are particularly romantic, so we can stick with the common name and just ignore where it came from. All right. There you go. Now, am I right in thinking there are dogwoods from very distinct parts of the world? Oh yes. There are species that are restricted to North America. And that's the subject of today's video, exclusively North American dogwoods. Yep. But we need to consider that there's some that go down into South America, there are a number of Asian species, there are also quite a number that come from Europe, yep. and they even extend down into Africa. So they do in fact come from a very broad range, and in fact the genus may or may not even stay intact as a genus as time goes on, mm. because they can be split into about four different genera, fairly logically, although I must admit I'll be very sad if I end up holding the collection of Cornus, Benthamidia, Swida, and Camipericlymenum uh, as the All genuses right. of the National Collection. I'm already zoning out, but I know that I'm very happy that you really enjoy all that nomenclature malarkey. Mm. And we are going to do a video about the, the Asiatic dogwoods when they're in bloom, which is a bit later in the season. Yeah. Uh, right? Yes, so we'll hopefully cover those and, and the you, oddments later. And do you have some of those other ones, like the African ones? And No, I have to say I haven't in the collection so far managed to get any South American or African dogwoods. Mm. So all of the collection consists of European through Asia and through North America. So all that sort of Northern Hemisphere-y bit. Not bad. Yeah, that's not a bad effort. All right, so here we are, the National Collection. And we'll just point out that Plant Trust is, explain to the viewers what that is, what it does. All right, well, Plant Trust is an organization that registers collections so that we then have them properly documented. We then know where they are, who's looking after them. Uh, hopefully the nomenclature is all correct. So any collection <laughs> holder that has a collection needs to keep up to date with their nomenclature. And if something were to happen, you know, heaven forbid, but you know, we all die eventually, then we hope that Plant Trust will be able to help with moving collections forward, getting them into botanic gardens, you know, managing that plant material, because in Australia we have lost so much stuff over the last few decades. Really? And of course it's getting so expensive and so difficult to import plant material now that we're probably unlikely to bring some of this material back again if we don't save it whilst it's here. Interesting point. So we'll put the link to Plant Trust below. Okay, where is our first American adventure going to take us? All right, well, let's start on the West Coast and have a look at their iconic corners. Let's go. All right, Matthew, why don't we start on the West Coast of North America? I'd love a little balmy Californian weather in yes, this well, misty, <laughs> rainy Macedon. Yeah, well, it might be more Oregon and further north that you'd be looking at. Okay, yes. Uh, Cornus nuttali, which is sort of above us here, so we'll get some close-ups of it. Somewhat difficult to film, I'm afraid. Yeah, it is. It's a very upright and one of the tallest growing of the dogwoods. Yes. It also gets huge white flowers on it. Yep. Sometimes throws some late summer flowers, so it can be sort of uh, multi-seasonal plant and it is 
named after Thomas Nuttall, yes. who died in the 1830s, and he yeah. was an English botanist who spent a lot of time traveling and collecting in North America. Yeah. So he's had this famous dogwood named after him. So if you're going to try and grow Cornus Nuttalli, yes. uh, allow it some height, yes. because if you plant it under something, it's never going to perform well. It can get up to six meters or more in height, so mm. it is one of the biggest of the genus. And certainly as far as wild species are concerned, its flowers are the biggest of the genus as well. So there you go. Now, where do you find it? So you joked about it's not Californian and temperate. So where is it found? Well, it's found up along the Rockies, going up into sort of uh, Oregon, Washington State, all those sort of areas. So hardy, very cold, hardy. Cold hardy, yes. Not so heat and dry tolerant. So like most of the genus, it likes a cooler climate. So what about yours then? How does it go in summer? Well, it's fine because it's facing south. Mm. So its roots are always in the shade with the building behind it. So mm. it never gets any issues with the roots being baked by the sun. Right. And you've got to remember that we're in a reasonably high elevation here. So although we get hot days, we get cool nights and things mm. have a chance to sort of refurbish themselves mm. you know if, if you've got a hot night followed by a hot day followed by another hot night mm. well that tends to stress plants out more mm. than if it cools right down in the evening right now so if the east coast and the west coast met in perfect harmony what would we have we would have the hybrid that is well known that we're going to have a look at now okay let's go I'm standing beneath a rather splendid specimen of the hybrid dogwood called Eddie's White Wonder. Rather a naff name, I have to say, but it was named by a Mr. Eddie's in Canada who did the original breeding, uh, and he was awarded a posthumous Cory Cup for excellence in uh, breeding this particular dogwood. Now, the original plant of this is growing in the Van Dusen Botanic Gardens in Vancouver. I've been there, seen the original tree, and mine's better. So what can I say? So this particular variety was bred uh, using Cornus Florida, the eastern North American dogwood, and Cornus nuttalli, which is the western North American dogwood. So we'll see both of them during this film. Uh, and it has a beautiful habit, slightly weeping form, very large white flowers, and stunning autumn foliage. I must say, Stephen, you've planted some of your dogwoods in slightly inaccessible spots. I wasn't considering filming when I planted these things. But anyhow, we can sort of see what we're looking at here. So we're on the east coast. Yes. So this is uh, the wild white form of Cornus Florida. Yep. So the eastern dogwood. Now, we're, Florida's in the name, but what is the range? Well, of... <laughs> it goes most of the way up on the east coast of North America. Right. So Even it, to the the colder winter north. Yes, and it was probably called Cornus Florida because that's probably where it was first discovered. Right. But then it would have been found in a wider range as time went on. Right. So there you go. Yep. Cornus Florida in the white form is the one that you will see in the wild most of the time. The yep. pink one shows up in odd spots and lots of different varieties and cultivars and things have been developed from this plant mm -hmm. uh, or shown up in cultivation. So there's variegated ones, gold leafed ones, weeping ones, you name it. There's all sorts of different corners Florida's out there yeah so this is the wild version though and a truly beautiful plant it is I might add I really do like the corners flowers when they're not fully open they look like little presents ready for unwrapping and so you get this rather lovely three-dimensional effect from them and then of course they will eventually open to this lovely flat four bracted flower which is a classic beauty I think so while we're here on the East Coast, can we talk general care for the East Coast corners then? So give me some basic rules of engagement. All right. Sun. Sun, filtered sun is best. They don't like the really hot afternoon sun unless you're right up in the hills where it's much cooler. Yep. They like a leaf Water. mouldy soil. Oh, okay, soil. Yeah, so they, they like a, a soil that's high in leaf mould and plenty of mulch around the roots. Yep. They don't seem to mind whether it's acidic or alkaline yep. particularly. That doesn't seem to matter. Water. They don't like to dry right out, mm. basically. They like good drainage, but they like a little bit of moisture, mm. and a cool root run is really what it's more about. Mm. Uh, and I guess the other thing you need to know about any of the North American dogwoods, mm. which includes this one and the other one, they are all prone to a fungal disease called anthracnose, mm. and we'll show you some dead branches in this one that have been <laughs> created by anthracnose. Fun, fun. Um, it's a leaf spotting disease, fungal disease, that weakens the plants, will often kill uh, 
outright plants that are in poor health already wow. and it has somehow managed to find its way into Australia and so unfortunately if you're going to grow any of the cornices the flowering ones from North America then you have to either live with the fungal disease or try and deal with it. And how do you deal with it? Well you use uh, a classical fungicide like you use for curly leaf for peach trees and what have you. Yeah. You need to spray when the uh, buds are just starting to swell in mm. the late winter early spring and then you'll probably need to give it a backup spray on a fairly regular basis. It's just one of those things. Does it work? Is it, given the size of the plants? Yeah, well, that's where the big problem comes mm. in. You know, how do you spray the top of a plant that's five metres tall? Because I hold the national collection of corners here, I've decided that I have to have them all, or as many of them as I can get in Australia. And I basically just live with the anthracnose. Uh, it does kill some of the branches. Uh, it does make the plants look a bit scruffy and miserable some years. Yeah. But some years it's worse than others. So some years there's hardly any sign of it. Right. Uh, so it sort of waxes and wanes. But it is a serious problem with cornice in the wild, unfortunately. So th obviously this disease, this fungal disease, originated on the west coast of the USA? No. Oh! It originated in China, quite likely, because the Chinese and Japanese dogwoods are basically immune to the fungal disease. It oh, doesn't affect them particularly. Right. But once it got into North America, it's gone nuts and it's actually attacking all of the flowering dogwoods in North America. So the West and the East Coast dogwoods both get the anthracnose disease, uh, as does the hybrid Eddie's White Wonder. And in fact, there's a big breeding program going on in America to try and breed cornices that have, in fact, um, some immunity to anthracnose. Mm. And that seems to be working using the Asian species in the breeding program. And we're going to do a whole film about the Asian cornices, when the corni, when they're all in bloom. <laughs> yes, because they're a little bit later flowering. So in another month or two, we'll be doing one on them as well. And here we have the evil consequences of cornus anthracnose disease, whole dead branches in the bottom of my cornus florida, which I'll have to remove at some point. But you mentioned this is one form yep. of the Florida. Yeah, Cornus Florida in a straight form is here. The other one that you will find in the wild is Cornus Florida rubra, which is a wild form. Wild and, form. Yeah, so is... we can go and have a look at that. Let's go. All right. Stephen, what is this beautiful Cornus? This is the classical pink or red flowering North American dogwood, Cornus Florida rubra. And what a beauty she is. Yes. The name Florida should, of course, give things away. So it's from the eastern part of North America. But not Florida, surely. Yeah, it extends down into Florida. Yeah. So it does the subtropics? Yeah, well, sort of, but in the hills. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so it's the eastern state dogwood. There are two basic flowering species of dogwoods from North America. So yep. there's the Florida from the eastern states, yep. the other one, which is Cornus nuttallii, yep. which is the western American dogwoods. And so this is the most used variety then, you think, in gardening? It is probably by far the most popular of all of the dogwood forms and cultivars. Yep. It's the one everybody asks for when they come into the nursery. Yes, and, and you've got it. Yes, uh, I can supply it. So how big is this one going to get? All right, well, the dogwoods in general are small trees, almost shrubs with delusions of grandeur. <laughs> they, they can get up to around about the four to five metres in cultivation as a mm, rule. Mm. Well, this is a beauty. Let's go and look at another. All right, what is this beauty, Stephen? <laughs> well, we are looking at Corners Florida Pleurobracteata, which is the double flowered North American Eastern dogwood. So this is a naturally occurring form. Uh, possibly. I would imagine it was found in the wild somewhere. Yeah. Or it may have arisen in cultivation, but it's more likely to have arisen in the wild. Pleurobracteata, of course, means multiple bracts. Uh -huh. uh, so, hence the double flowering, even yeah. though the bracts are not exactly the flower. But anyhow, yeah. but it's not very commonly seen, this variety. Mm. So, same carrying conditions as all the others? Yep, yep. It's just a, a form that's arisen that has double flowers. So, basically, it requires all the same things and has all the same issues. There you go. Well, let's go and have a closer look at the flowers themselves and just see how they're different. All right, what a good idea. So, dogwoods are sort of famous for their flowers because they have this sort of wedding cakey tears yeah. of beautiful cream, white, pink. But... Well, they're even called flowering dogwoods, but in fact the flowers are the little tiny beady bits in the middle. So, so that is the flower, yeah. and this... Uh, they're coloured bracts, so they're actually modified leaves. So mm. the flowers are that little cluster of things in the middle. So that's the true flower of a dogwood, and if that's all it did, you probably wouldn't bother growing it. You wouldn't, but look at the pink. 
So that is the Florida Rubra. That's Florida Rubra. So that's how that one looks. Yeah. And there are other selections of that out in the trade, but they all look fairly similar. Yeah. So this is the um, this is the Florida double that we were looking yes. at. So let's just have a talk us through the flowers. So yeah. is that what it's going to do? They look a bit sort of deformed. <laughs> In fact, they could be considered that. Yes, it often doesn't completely open those bracts, yeah. uh, although they will sometimes pop open. Yeah. So it always has this sort of enclosed look to it. And it really is an interesting variant on the theme. Perhaps not everybody's taste, mm. um, but obviously I had to have it in the National Collection <laughs> anyway. Obviously. Yes. So in a nutshell, what we're first seeing is not the flower, it's a bract. Exactly. So A, a bit like hydrangeas then, all the, the colourful mm. bit that you see is the bract. Yes, on hydrangeas it's exactly the same thing. Uh, many of the showy looking viburnums also have bracts mm. instead of true flowers. Yeah. So there are a number of plants that have developed this same technique uh, and evolved in the same sort of way. And the issue for the plant is of course that it doesn't have to put the same energy into producing flowers because they're small and therefore don't require as much energy. Yeah. And the bracts are generally easier to produce than true petals and they last longer to attract pollinators. Ah, oh, so the plant's saving energy by yeah. adapting its leaf. Yeah, exactly. Oh, how interesting. And so the flower lasts for a lesser amount of time than the bracts on the outside? Uh, no, about the same, but they don't come out all at once. Right. So the true flowers, which are the little beady bits in the middle, yeah. they come out over a period. So they don't all pop open at once. Right. So it needs bracts. Mm. Which is like landing lights for pollinators. Well, exactly. It? So it sort of leads the insects into the flowers. Mm. And so they need to be able to stand there on the plant for a reasonably long time. So yeah. if it were a flowering cherry, it would need to be pollinated a damn sight faster because you've only got a very short span of time generally when those sort of plants, flowers stay open. Ah, interesting. Well, there mm. we go. When a flower is not a flower, yep. it's a bract. And of course, the double one has no flowers inside it at all. So oh. if you were to open this right up and look down inside you'll find that all of the flowers have turned into petaloid bracts all the way to the bottom so there's actually no flower in that flower if that makes any sense whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> so that can only reproduce itself vegetatively through well yeah cuttings. yeah we would well you would normally propagate most cornices from cuttings uh, anyway mm. so yes you would have to grow that vegetatively well talking at that point then um in the trade, are they grafted or are they not grafted? What's yeah. the best? There's a fair bit of uh, variation in how different growers grow the cornices. Mm. Some people do graft different varieties onto a hardier understock. Yep. And the one they often use is Cornus capitata, which is one of the Chinese evergreen dogwoods. Mm. It's a little more heat tolerant than the North American ones. Uh, and so in Australia, it often is used as an understock. Mm. But I prefer them if I can to be on their own roots, because then if anything comes up from low down, it's not going to be understock. It's part of the original tree that you wanted. All right. So there you go. Well, Stephen, a romp through Cornus, Cornus 101. Yes. Well, well as American the, Cornus. Yes, American Cornus. Uh, and I have to say, we've concentrated on the flowers of the different forms that are out there. But remember that there's a lot of selections that were made for other reasons, whether they be coloured leaves, yeah. uh, whether they be a dwarf form, whether they be a weeping form. So there's lots and lots of diversity in the North American dogwoods. Mm. Okay, have we exhausted your national collections? Not by a long shot. What right. else have you got? Oh, well, there's the uh, Acanthus collection, the Sambucus collection, and the Osmanthus collection. Well, we've done Sambucus, and we mentioned an Acanthus, that amazing African one. Yes. So I think we've touched on those. Osmanthus. Yes, we'll have to do that at some point or another. Okay, watch mm. this space. And if you want to see what we're doing next week, Stephen, what might it be? Well, who knows? Uh, we'll be doing something of a horticultural bent, undoubtedly. And to know, you'll have to hit subscribe. We do post every Friday and we do post our shorts every Monday. So if you have got a question for Stephen, mm, please come on board and ask it. If he can answer, we'll record it. Yes, <laughs> seems only fair. You do know most things. Anyway, we look forward to seeing you next week. All right, bye all.